Chapter 2 The Maze of Merciless Bannons In the flickering dark of the burning city, with the night pierced by the screams of dying men and the air stagnant with the stench of scorched flesh, he could feel power surge in his body, raw, primal, and awesome in its terrible magnificence. It roared through his veins like a living thing, firing every nerve and synapse, awakening them to the eldritch power that soaked his flesh. Power. The power to rip apart mountains. Power to smash the puny warrens of the enemies and entomb them forever with their treachery. Power to obliterate the stinking hovels of the humans and grind their pathetic, preening breed beneath the clawed feet of the skaven. Power. Power second only to that of the horned rat himself, mightiest of gods. No, he corrected himself. With such power he was no longer a simple thing of flesh and spirit. He was a god himself, ascended like the infamous blasphemer Quithul the Vile. His was the power to rend and slay and rip and tear. His was the power to rule, to hold the under-empire and the broken rubble of the miserable human surface realm in a claw of iron. He would squeeze that claw until the world screamed, and everything knew that it lived only because he allowed it. And then the power flickered, cringing from him, retreating from his body like a wisp of ashy smoke from a smith's furnace. His mind railed with horror as he felt his newfound magnificence deserting him. It was unfair, unjust that he should be cheated of this moment of ascendancy. His eyes were pits of rage as he scoured the darkened streets of the burning city, looking for the traitor who had sabotaged his ultimate triumph. There would be blood and vengeance when he found them. He would bury his muzzle in their breast and gnaw out their beating heart with his fangs. Then rage shattered in his mind, sent whimpering to some black corner of his being. The last of the divine power had swept through his body, abandoning him as he squirted a mask of fear from his glands. There were figures moving in the dark street, striding purposefully through the swirling smoke and dancing embers. One was the tall, straight figure of a man, his reek foully familiar as it struck the scaven senses. He only felt contempt for the man, but there was a reason he had vented his glands in terror. If the man was here... The second figure emerged from behind the veil of smoke. He was much shorter than the man, but stoutly and broadly built. Thick knots of muscle, like writhing jungle serpents, coiled around the apparition's arms. Crude tattoos in the cut scroll of the dwarves littered the figure's bare chest and the sides of his shaven pate. A massive crest, dyed the same bright orange as the dwarf's thick beard, sprouted from the center of his otherwise shorn scalp. The dwarf's battered face grinned evilly behind old scars and bruises. A missing eye was covered with a weathered leather patch. The other eye burned into the scavens with a stare of murderous malevolence. This time, vermin, you taste my axe. Huge and cruelly sharp, like the hand of some savage demon of war, the star metal blade came hurtling towards the scaven, driven by all the monstrous power in the dwarf's swollen arms. Gracier Fankwell snapped awake his entire body twitching in terror at the nightmare which had fallen upon his sleeping mind. Empty glands tried to squirt the fear scent, but he could tell from the heavy fog that surrounded him that he had already emptied them in his sleep. More troubling than his undignified display of scent, however, was the fact that he hadn't heard himself cry out. Fankwell tried to open his jaws, finding them thickly tethered by a leather muzzle. Rolling his tongue around inside his mouth, he found that he had been further gagged with an iron bit. Instinctively, he raised his hands to remove the vexing intrusion. He found his paws carefully bound by little mittens of iron, his clawed fingers safely locked away inside a cold metal shell. Panic thundered inside Fankwell's chest, his heart hammering like a crazed goblin against his ribs. Carefully, desperately, Fankwell forced himself to become calm. Turn fear into hate he told himself. It was the maxim that had built the Under-Empire and given the Skaven race dominance of the Underworld. Fear wouldn't do anything to help him now. Hate, however, just might. 
revenge was a powerful incentive for staying alive. Fankul cursed the nightmare memory of the devil spawn dwarf and the preening human he kept as a pet. All the misery and misfortune had started the day the horse and pair intruded into his affairs. He was so close, so tantalizingly close to achieving the grand plot he had proposed to Seer Lord Critislick. The traitorous human dupe he had spent so long training and grooming to become his pawn was finally reaching his potential, finally ready to be put to the purpose Fankul required of him. Fritz von Hallstatt, chief of Naun's secret police, would have murdered the brother of the human emperor once Fankul provided him with the evidence that the aristocrat was involved in a conspiracy against the Countess of Naun. Fankul understood enough about the brood loyalty of humans, even if he found it incomprehensible. The Emperor would retaliate, the Countess would resist, believing the evidence von Hallstatt presented her. War would be the result, war between the Emperor and the wealthy Warren Kingdom of Naln. Favors and loyalties owed to both sides would cause the conflict to spread, and where those were not enough, agents of the Skaven would sow further lies and deception. Before long, the humans would be slaughtering one another wholesale. When they were weak enough, the Skaven would emerge from their burrows and take their rightful place as inheritors of the service world. Such a grand scheme, surely inspired by the Horned Rat himself. Even the Seer Lords had been impressed, although Critislake had insisted on tampering with it slightly so that he could claim part of the glory when the humans were brought to ruin. Perhaps that was where things had started to go wrong when Seer Lord Critislick had started tinkering with Fankul's brilliant vision. It was a thought which occurred to Fankul before, but one he knew it would not take a gag to prevent him from ever speaking aloud. He doubted if even Seer Lord Critislick could contrive a scheme complicated enough to employ that hell-sent dwarf as a pawn, either willing or unwittingly. Yet, who else could have managed such a feat if not Critislick? Fankul refused to believe it was dumb, blind randomness that had drawn the dwarf and his pet across his path. Everything would have succeeded but for them. Fankul would have become the most renowned grey seer since Nodoom rescued the Black Ark from the wizard who dared steal it from the sanctuary deep beneath Skaven Blight. It was too much to think that it was circumstance that caused the cursed pair to kill von Hallstatt before Fankul could make use of him. Too much to think that any dwarf, however crazed, could fell a mighty rat ogre like his unfortunate bone ripper in a single blow. Nor was that the end of the meddling. The pair had lingered in the human warren kingdom of Nuln, interfering in Fankwell's attempts to recover the situation. They had spoiled his efforts to abduct the Countess, ruined his attempt to cement an alliance with the warlock engineers of Clan Scryer by stealing a human-built steam tank and thwarted his all-out attack against Nuln itself, an attack that, by rights, should have left the city a smoldering crater. Oh, to be certain, the Lords of Decay had been most lavish in their praise of Fankul's efforts. They had tactfully ignored the intention of his grand scheme, and instead focused upon the damage inflicted on the man-city and the severe losses suffered by the warriors of Clan Scab during the fighting. Clan Scab, they said, had been growing seditious. As a result of the fighting in Nuln, they were now too weak to act on any rebellious thoughts. Seer Lord Critislick himself had rewarded Fankuol, presenting him with a new rat ogre to replace the one he lost. He was even given freedom and the resources to pursue his vendetta against the cursed dwarf and his underling. Fankuol should have suspected then, but he allowed his own ambition and his deep need for revenge to cloud his judgment. He gathered a new band of minions and pursued the dwarf far into the north. The battle that followed should have been a resounding victory. Fangol had planned it to the smallest detail. Instead, his wretched minions had allowed themselves to be destroyed and routed by the filthy dwarves. His second bone ripper performed even more wretchedly than the original, killed by the dwarf's pet before he could even lay a paw upon him. Fangol was right to have been suspicious. Few Skaven could have had such sharp instincts. If he had trusted the miserable wretch to protect him, hadn't it been Critis Lake who had suggested to employ the Rat Ogre as a bodyguard? Pursuing the dwarf and his allies had led Fankul even further north, 
most of his carefully hoarded wealth being spent to gather more warriors and to purchase a proper bodyguard, a hulking beast worthy of the name Bone Ripper. To remind Seer Lord Kritislik of the importance of Fanquil's brilliant and cunning mind, he sent a runner back to Skavenblight, telling the Lords of Decay about the airship the dwarves had built, and in which his despised enemy had so cravenly quit the battlefield. Now, he was not simply going to accomplish the elimination of a hated foe of the Under Empire, but also secure a technology which made the loss of the steam tank in Null insignificant. But things continued going wrong. His agent, the sniveling and faithless Lurk Snitchtung, who, in his foresight, Fankul had sent to hide in the airship before its escape, returned from his experience mutated and savage, exposed to the raw power of the blighted chaos wastes. His paw-picked warriors, after occupying the airship staging area in Kislev and imprisoning the human defenders, were too glutted on their recent success to obey his exacting commands when the airship finally returned. Had they followed his strict orders, the damnable contraption would have been his, and all the miserable occupants at the Gracier's mercy. Instead, they had been foolish, treacherously rushing in and getting themselves slaughtered. Even the wretched dolt of a rat ogre managed to get itself killed. Bone Ripper. Bah. Fankwell always knew the gruesome things were nothing but bad luck. Only the Gracier's genius and liberal ingestion of warpstone to augment his magical powers, had enabled him to escape the treacherous bungling of his subordinates. His only comrade as he scurried away from the debacle was the grotesque Lurk, now little more than a rat ogre himself, albeit with a troubling knot of hunger in his scent. Even worse, they had been captured by the pickets of a massive horde of deranged humans from the Northlands. It had taken a wit as sharp and tricky as Fankuol's to deceive the barbarians into releasing them, and he had made sure to use the escape to put as many of their fellow Skaven between the marauders and himself as quickly as possible, seeking out the closest and largest Skaven warren in the area. That led to his entry into Hellpit, the noxious city of Clan Molder, breeders of the many beasts and monsters which slaved away for the Skaven in the dark reaches of their realm. Isaac Grottle, the fat worm, had been there, spinning his lies to the elders of the clan, convincing them it had been Fankuol and not his own conniving and perfidy which had resulted in the failure of the attack on Nuln, and the loss of many of the clan's beastmasters. Instead of welcoming the Gracier, Fankuol found himself a prisoner, and one destined for a very short stay. Again, Destiny and a horned rat smiled upon him. At any other time, Clan Mulder would have happily disposed of Fankuol. Indeed, it was rare a thing for a Gracier to fall into any clan's paws in so vulnerable a condition. Working up the nerve to actually do the deed was what was delaying them, Fankuol was certain. For even as a prisoner, his reputation was enough to strike terror in such vermin. The issue never came to open confrontation, however. In their foolishness, the flesh changers of Helpit have taken Lurk away to experiment upon him in their laboratories. Instead, the mutant had broken free, lost himself in the lower warrens, and incited a rebellion against the Molder's Skaven slaves. Hopelessly out of their depth, unable to keep even their clan rats from defecting to the insurrection, the High Packmaster had turned to Fankuol to save Helpit. A pettier Skaven would have refused but Fankul was gracious enough to aid Clan Mulder, despite the indignities they had inflicted upon him. With his brilliant leadership, the revolt was quickly broken. His only regret was in that confusion Lurk had somehow contrived to lose himself in the tunnels and escape his well-deserved reward for betraying his old master and blasphemy against the horned rat. Still, the danger was not gone. Lurk had treasonably allowed himself to be used by the sorcerers of the Northmen to weaken Helpit for their horde to conquer. Selflessly, Fankol did not depart for Skavenblight and his long-deferred report to the Council of Thirteen, deciding to stay and help Clan Mulder escape complete ruin. After all, had it not been the mighty Gracier Fankol who had led the warriors of Clan Mulder in battle against the Northmen warlord Alaric Lionmane, when he had brought his barbarians against the strongholds scattered beneath the troll country. 
the horde had been broken and all but annihilated as a result of Fankwall's decisive strategy. If Mulder's dull claw leaders had followed the Gracier's intricate battle plan even more closely, Mulder's army would have emerged unscathed. But no reasonable mind could hold him to blame for the loss of an army that was too stupid to display a proper understanding of tactics. Fortunately, the brood mothers of Helpit had used the years since Alaric's horde was routed to birth a new army for Clan Mulder. Fanquo led the solid ranks of armored storm vermin, fierce clan rats, and the many beasts of Mulder's flesh forges against the brutish Northmen, the elite vanguard of Arik Demonclaw, who had entrusted only the best of his warriors with the job of facing the Skaven, taking the dregs of his host to attack the humans in Prague. Fankwall had to admit that Clan Mulder's new army was better than the last one. But then, of course, his battle plan was better as well, even with the fat, squealing Isaac Grottle trying to take a hand in the strategizing. When that was over, Fankwall had the pleasure of watching his second Northman horde break and scatter like the skull of a baby dwarf. This time there was none of the awkwardness of being the only Skaven alive to enjoy the retreat. After that battle, Thankwell took his leave of Clan Mulder, Helpid, and the two-scented Isaac Grottle. The Gracier accepted only the smallest measure of reward from the High Packmaster. After all, the Flesh Changers were a simple and foolish breed, and it would be unkind to take advantage of them and point out that what they offered him was hardly what a more refined Skaven would call generous. Besides, he was eager to make his report to the Council of Thirteen. In Skaven Blight he had friends, ones that would help him settle debts incurred during his stay in the North. Through the tunnels of the Under Empire, carried by the sickly Skaven slaves given to him by the Clan Mulder, Fangul hurried, his mind afire with future plans and past grudges. Fangul rubbed one of his horns against his shoulder, trying to get at an itch he couldn't reach with his chained paws. No matter which way he twisted his neck or tilted his head, he couldn't quite find the spot. Another indignity unjustly inflicted upon him by those who were jealous of his genius, and a favor displayed to him by the horned rat. He'd had a fine taste of how deep the envy of his fellows went upon his return to Skaven Blight. Instead of being welcomed back as the loyal and capable servant he was, Fangol had been seized by the elite storm vermin who guarded the Lords of Decay and the Shattered Tower. He was dragged before Seer Lord Critislick in chains, presented to them like some seditious heretic. Critislick informed him that they were displeased by his failure to capture the dwarf airship. Disturbed by his inability to inform the Council of Arak Demonclaw's attack on Kislev in time to allow them to exploit it for their purposes, and upset by reports that he had engineered a slave revolt in Helped without a Seer Lord's authorization. Despite his best efforts to explain these seeming failures to Critislick, the Seer Lord was deaf to his words. He was stripped of his staff and amulet, the talismans of office as Grey Seer and agent of the Council, and thrown into some blighted hole deep beneath the streets of Skaven Blight. Fankwall was more certain than ever that Critislick had been behind his downfall from the beginning. It was the Seer Lord who had put that hell-spawn dwarf in his way probably the treacherous Lurk Snitch Tongue, and all the other enemies who had beset him as well. Envious of Fankwall's brilliance, doubting Fankwall's tireless devotion and loyalty. Fankwall was right to have plotted against a senile old mouse, when he thought about all the times he had squirted a musk of fear just to convey a respectful scent in the fool's presence. As Fankwall's eyes adjusted to the darkness, he suddenly froze. His surroundings were different. He wasn't in the same dreary little hole anymore. He had fought back to the pathetic bones he had been thrown by his gods the night before. They had tasted strange, but he had been too ravenous with hunger to care. Now he knew that the marrow had been treated with some kind of drug, a drug that left him insensible long enough for the captors to gag him and bind him, to remove him from his prison to this place. But where was this place? Fankwell's stomach clenched and his empty glance tried to vent. He had a terrible feeling he knew. The maze of inescapable death. The most insidious of the many ways the Council of Thirteen employed to dispose of those who displeased them. The maze was a trap-filled network of tunnels and warrens. 
a nest of pits and spikes and boiling oil. The walls reinforced with steel rods, so that even the most desperate Skaven could not gnaw his way to freedom. In all the centuries since it was built, no Skaven had ever escaped from the maze for just one simple reason. There was no way out. Fankwall stared at the ceiling, feeling his head swim as he saw tiny lights wink into existence, as the comforting closeness of the roof faded away into the vast, horrifying emptiness of the night sky. He knew it was a trick, a dwarf-made illusion plundered from the shattered halls of the City of Pillars. He knew that it was not stars he saw, but simply tiny bits of amber and pearl set into a black-painted ceiling. He recognized the deception for what it was, but he couldn't stop the instinctual revulsion crawling through his body. Untold generations of breeding, fighting and dying in the closed tunnels and cluttered warrens of the Under Empire had made the Skaven a race of agoraphobics, imprinting a terror of open spaces into the most primal part of their psyche. The Grey Seer tried to overcome his fear with his knowledge, to let intellect subdue unruly instinct. It was the fiendish nature of the nameless and accursed Ratman who had constructed a maze that the Labyrinth should use the Skaven's own natural urges to destroy him. Instinct versus Intellect An unequal contest in most Skaven, who were little cleverer than the common rats who they shared their burrows with. But in the case of a mind like Fangwall's, genius would prevail. The nameless architects of the maze had not figured upon the brilliance such as that of the mind of the Grey Seer. Fankwell caught himself as he was wedging towards the wall of the tunnel, fighting down the desperate need to feel raw earth against his whiskers, to assure himself he was not falling into the enormous void of the sky above. He ground his fangs against the pit in his mouth, feeling annoyance that he had allowed his body to move at such primitive and petty urgings. The builders of the maze would know that huddling up against the wall would be the natural response of a skaven confronted by the sprawling starfield above them. They might have hidden anything in the wall to settle with such weak minds. Spring-loaded spikes treated in warp venom. Jets of immolating warp flame billowing outwards from projectors buried beneath a thin layer of crust. Maybe even a hidden pivot to allow the wall to spin and crush the victim. Each image made Fankwall more nervous than the last, and he slowly backed away from the offending wall. When he felt raw earth crumble behind his furred back, the Skaven leapt ten feet into the center of the tunnel, wide-eyed with fright, not caring how inappropriate such a display of raw fear was for a grey Skaven of his status. His retreat from the first wall had backed him into the other side of the tunnel. Only reflexes as owned and precise as his own could have allowed escape from so injudicious a moment. Fankwall watched the wall he had brushed against, waiting anxiously for it to explode in some kind of violence. When it didn't, he felt almost disappointed, but he should have guessed that the speed of his amazing reactions was quicker than whatever device the architects had hidden. Before the death machine could even be triggered, Fankwell was already gone. Now he stood in the darkness, listening to his own heart pounding in his chest. Fankwell's other senses became more alert. He could discern a faint, bittersweet smell. He could feel the air shifting slightly, betraying the merest suggestion of current and movement. He could hear an indistinct noise, a dim scratching sound from beneath the rocky floor, giving him the impression of rusty gears grinding together. There was no escape from the maze, but Fankwall was determined to fight just the same. If he could find something to rid himself of his muzzle and fetters, he would be able to draw upon his magic to tip the balance back in his favor. However fiendish the architects, Fankwall didn't think they could have reckoned with the mystic might of a grey seer when they built their trap. Keeping his eyes averted from the disconcerting illusion of the false sky, Fankwall carefully made his way down the tunnel. He was careful to stay away from the walls and kept a wary watch on the places he set his feet. Ahead, the tunnel split into five different corridors, like fingers stretching away from a hand. He paused, sniffing at the air, trying to decide which corridor to take. He had a good feeling about the leftmost path. The Skaven lashed his tail in annoyance, remembering that this place was designed to go the victim into destroying himself. Fankwall turned away from the left path, instead creeping down the center corridor. 
He only had taken a dozen paces when instinct took over and he threw himself to the floor. An instant later, a great blast of green warp fire whooshed overhead, searing its way down the tunnel. The smell of a singed fur told the gray seer how almost nearly he had been caught, the flames licking at his back even as he crushed himself against the floor. Vankul lifted himself off the ground, scowling at the darkness. There was no mistaking the sound of gears grinding together beneath the floor this time. He could feel the tunnel itself rumbling. Quickly, he retreated back the way he had come. He just reached the intersection when the trapped tunnel began to rotate, moved by the machinery hidden beneath it. Soon, where the corridor had been, Fankul could only see a bare stone wall. The Gracier did not spend over long contemplating the buried machinery, or the question of whether it operated automatically or it was guided by some malefic intelligence. Having escaped the warp fire, Fankwall was more inclined to trust his initial impression and travel down the leftmost tunnel. Certainly it could not be less hazardous than picking a path at random, as he had already done. That bittersweet scent was stronger as Fankwall entered the left tunnel. Now the Gracier identified the odor, his suspicions of trickery becoming even more pronounced. It was the smell of refined warpstone, but warpstone that was allowed to age for an unbelievable amount of time. It was the kind of thing that would pluck at a Skaven's mind and guide him on even without his conscious mind being aware of the pole. Fankwall, however, was aware of what it was that lured him down the tunnel. He knew he walked into a trap, and his every sense was on the alert. He froze when a slight shift in the heavy air suggested movement. When the bright flash of metal in the blackness flickered past his eyes, he arrested every muscle and waited for the pendulum to withdraw back into its hidden niche. Briefly he toyed with the idea of using the sharp edge of the pendulum to cut his feathers, but quickly disabused himself of the impulse, fearing that the blade had been treated with some kind of ghastly poison by his captors. Scurrying in the dark, Fankwall allowed the scent of warpstone to guide him. He continued to shun the walls, continued to avert his eyes from the disorienting glare of the starfield. It was not escape that goaded him onwards. He knew there was none from the maze of inescapable death. No, it was something more primitive and elemental that motivated him. Food and water were his concern now, excited by the smell of warpstone. His physical needs had to be sated before he attacked the problem of removing his bonds and making a fight of the maze's ordeal. Down through the murk of the winding tunnel, Fankwell was drawn, even his cunning mind tortured by the effort of keeping track of the trail. The way the tunnel doubled back upon itself, he wondered if maybe buried machinery wasn't moving the corridors behind him, rotating and turning so that he was caught in an endlessly repeating cycle. The thought chilled him as much as it excited his appreciation for the sadistic minds which had built the maze. If the winding tunnels were being rotated by machines, at least there was a purpose behind their movements. Turning one last corner, Fankwell was surprised to find himself looking out into a wide cavern. Stalactites dripped from the ceiling, spoiling the effect of the pearl stars and silver moons suspended overhead. The walls were at least partially worked, displaying the marks of tools rather than the scratches of claw and fang. He couldn't see any other openings in the cavern and very soon lost interest in looking for any, his eyes locked to the object in the center of the chamber. It was a black stone marked by veins of green glowing in the darkness. If Ankle had any doubts about the bittersweet scent, he could not mistake the colors of warpstone. The rock stood upon a small plinth of copper upon which the gracier could see scratchy runes and elaborate pictoglyphs. Old writing, very old indeed, possibly even predating the rise of the Skaven themselves. Intrigued now by something more than hunger, Fankwell crept towards the plinth. Curiosity was a vice that had served the Skaven race well down their centuries. Although, given the opportunity, any Skaven with an ounce of wit preferred to let one of his subordinates take on the risk of exploration and inquiry. Fankul did not have the luxury, however, a fact which made him curse Kritislik again. A few Skaven slaves, or even a truculent giant rat, would have been reassuring under the circumstances. No Skaven felt at ease without the scent of a dozen of its kind filling its nose. 
Fangwall fought down the urge of both hunger and curiosity, remembering only too well where he was. Instead, he kept his distance from the plinth, circling it warily and studying it from afar. Abruptly he stopped, fixing his gaze on the block of warpstone. Now he could see that the rock had been sculpted, carved into a crude likeness in a style as primitive as it was ancient. It was the rough shape of a skaven, paws set upon its knees and with its tail curled about its lap. Great horns like mighty glaives rose from the brow of the statue's head. Fankul prostrated himself on the floor, groveling in pious fear before the representation of the horned rat himself. Now Fankul understood where he was. This was not the maze of inescapable death. It was the only slightly less deadly maze of merciless penance, used by the seer lord to test those grey seers whose loyalty and capability was cast into doubt. This maze was designed to determine whether a skaven still retained the good favor of the horned rat. Only those who proved themselves here were ever seen again. The others became victims of the labyrinth. Like any proper skaven, Fankul feared and envied his god. But now there was a despair-born sincerity in his pleas to the horned rat for salvation. If the horned one would only spare his miserable and unworthy servant, Fankwal would work tirelessly to ensure his domination of the world above. No more would he think about his own ambition and greed, his secret dream to raise himself as seer lord and see the bones of Critislick gnawed by the whelps of his own brood. He would even forsake the vengeful obsession to destroy that damnable dwarf and his foppish pet, if only the horned rat would hear him now. In the midst of the deal-making prayers, Fankwell suddenly felt a compulsion to lift his head from the floor. He stared at the image of the horned rat for only an instant, and then his eyes fixed on something above and beyond the statue. Two blue stars shone in eerie false night, set among some of the rocky groves that peppered the ceiling. There was something disquiet about the sapphire lights, and Fanko started to turn his head when he became aware of something that had him forgetting about mazes and gods, and even about warpstone and hunger. The blue stars were moving. Slowly, agonizingly slowly, the sapphire lights were creeping across the roof. Now Fanko could see that they were not merely set among the rocky groves, they were fixed to a big projection of stone. Only, it wasn't stone just something that blended itself with the stone, the better to hunt its prey. Terrors out of whelphood rose up fresh in Fanquil's mind. All the boogie stories told by vindictive Skaven slaves to frighten their charges. Tales of the Under Empire and the lightless miles of empty tunnel between Burrow and Warren. Gruesome fables about what haunted the tunnels, ready to reach out and snatch the unwary Skaven who dared the dark alone. The thing on the ceiling was one such myth. Until this moment, Fankwell had not believed such a thing could be any more than the crazed imaginings of the insect-obsessed clan Worms. Still, there was no mistaking the monster for what it was. Now that he was aware of it, Fankwell could pick out the shape of its many spindly legs, the long abdomen and its armored thorax. He could see the angular head with its jewel-like eyes of sapphire and its hideous mouth of serrated plates. Two arch shadows dangling down from it were certainly the monster's claws, great ripping things designed to catch and hold the prey while the monster's mandibles tore slivers of meat from its screaming victim. A Tregara, the panther of the underworld. A monstrous mantis-like predator which found no prey so much to his liking as the Skaven. Even now, staring back with its sapphire eyes, Thankwall found it difficult to believe the thing was real. He ransacked his mind for every half-remembered story he had been told about the monster. Above him, slowly and silently, the Tregara continued to creep forwards. Blind. Yes, that was something he remembered. Fankul prided himself on recalling such an old and seemingly useless bit of memory. There was more. It wasn't able to scent prey any more than a skaven could catch a scent from an insect's own pale rocky body. But then, how did it hunt? The Tregara was almost directly above the plinth now. Fankwell shuddered as he saw how big it was, at least twice his own height and coated in thick plates of chitin. As he trembled, the insect rotated its head, seeming to fix its blind gaze on the gracier. 
Fankel knew it was not his imagination when the Tregara's lethargic stalk across the ceiling quickened. Movement. That was how the Tregara hunted. Even the slightest motion would betray Fankul to the monster. The Skaven struggled to calm himself, to still his lashing tail and quivering limbs. He forced himself to look away from the gigantic insect, only too aware that while he looked at it, any effort to calm himself was doomed. Long moments passed. Fankul expected the scythe-like claws to come sweeping down to snatch him at any moment. When nothing happened, he risked raising his face from the floor. The Tregara was almost directly over him. He could see the stone-like markings on its back now, could hear the scrape of its body against the rock as it moved. The sight was too much for Fankul's self-control. Screaming into his gag, the Gracier scurried across the floor on hands and feet, racing away from the sinister predator with all the grace and terror of a mammoth rat. Dignity and decorum were the furthest thing from his mind as the Gracier darted back into the tunnel, like a giant mouse disappearing into its hole. Down the narrow, winding tunnels, Fankul ran, his replenished glands venting themselves. Only once did he risk looking back. Two sapphire lights shone from the roof of the tunnel, the Tregara's clawed feet stabbing into the black rock as it hurtled after its fleeing prey. The insect's grim silence disturbed Fankul even more than the hiss of a serpent or the snarl of a cat, lending the Tregara an unnatural, almost elemental aura of inevitability. Fankul was not about to submit to the inevitable, whatever shape it assumed. There was always a way, a deception to work, a minion to blame, a superior to flatter. He had survived many things like this in life, from the black arts of the necromancer Vorgun of Prague, to the vile poxes of the plague lord Scratzquick and the mutated warriors of Arek Demonclaw. Even that hell-spawned dwarf had proven incapable of besting the mighty Gracier Fankuol. To end his father for some mindless tunnel lurker was too much for him to countenance. Now Fankuol was back at the intersection. Once more there were five tunnels branching away. Close behind him came the Tregara. He hesitated only a moment, and then quickly darted into the center tunnel. Fankul threw himself against the floor, crushing his body against the earth. For a terrible instant, he wondered if the trap mechanism had reset, or if the tunnel was indeed the right one. Suddenly, green fire roared overhead. A sickly, satisfying smell of burnt meat struck Fankul's senses. He looked overhead and watched as a long, scythe-like claw dropped away from the charred husk of a Tregara, its sapphire lights dimmed forever by the scorching blast of warp fire. The tunnel began to rumble once more. This time Fankul was too slow to retreat, instead being carried away as the entire corridor rotated. As it finished its cycle, the Gracier found himself blinking in the harsh glare of warpstone lanterns. He could hear the grind of machinery all around him, and could dimly perceive a massive tread wheel powered by Skaven slaves looming in the distance. Fangor's heart hammered against his ribs. He was not going to die. He hadn't been cast into the maze of inescapable death, but rather the maze of merciless penance. The horned rat had not abandoned his favorite instrument. He was being given another chance to prove himself. His masters had not consigned him to destruction. Much closer than the slaves was a large cluster of armored Skaven, their pallid fur taking on a greenish hue in the warp light. They were big, slavering brutes with breastplates of steel and wicked-looking halberds clutched tightly in their paws. Fankwell knew their scent, albino stormvermen, the elite guards of the Council of Thirteen. In their midst was another figure, nearly as tall as the hulking stormvermen. His fur was a murky gray that contrasted with the iron hue of the long flowing robes. Sigils, picked out in black rat hair thread, formed intricate patterns on the Skaven's garments. Huge horns as black as the thread rose from the Skaven's skull, curling into spiral antlers of bone. The face beneath the horns was pinched and drawn, and filled with such timeless malice as to make even the fiercest giant seem small and vulnerable. Fankuel abased himself before the seer lord Kritislik, bearing his throat to the elder priest sorcerer. If there was anything left in his glance, Fankuel would have vented them in deference to his master. 
but all the musk had already been used during the horrible chase by the Tregara. Kritislek's face pulled back in a fang-ridden smile of challenge, annoyed by the lack of respectful scent from Fankuol. After a moment, however, Kritislek divined a reason for such impropriety. The Seer Lord chuckled darkly. You survived the maze, Grey Seer Fankuol, Kritislek hissed. Good, good. The Horned One still likes favors you. Kritislek gestured with his paw, and two of the storm vermin advanced to the captive. Roughly, but quickly, they removed the muzzle from Fankwell's snout and the fetters from his paws. Cuffing, Fankwell spat the iron bit of his mouth and tried to work feeling back into his jaw. He became aware of Kritislek's impatient gaze upon him and threw himself back to the floor. I serve only the will desire of the Horned One, Fankwell whined. The word of the most terrifying, magnificent seer lord is my sacred commandment. Oh, benevolent tyrant, he added, deciding a display of fawning devotion might keep him from being returned to the maze. Kritislik seemed to ponder Fankwell's flattery, and then a cruel light crept into the ratman's eyes. You have been a capable servant, Gracier Fankwell, Kritislik said. The council finds itself in need of a dispa, a competent servant, for a matter of utmost delicacy. Kritislik gestured again, and the white storm vermin grabbed Fankwell by the shoulders and started to lead him away. The Gracier knew better than to struggle or protest. A less keen mind might have thought there was nothing worse than what could be inflicted upon him than the ordeal of the maze, and that there was nothing to be risked by resisting. Fankwell knew better. Where the insidious imagination of the Lords of Decay were concerned, there was always something worse. 